make a noise. Okay, so we have we have a woman who is a Samaritan, and the Samaritans, this area, Sinar, Shechem, the word itself means to be drunk or to be a worker. So this is an area that even by name is called the place of the workers or the place of the drunks. And we saw from Sirach, which is most likely was written originally in Hebrew, we find that Sirach says that these people are stupid. They're, they're not bound by wisdom. They are, you know, the people of Samaria, although they are genetically more, more Israel, more Jewish and, and Israeli and Hebrew than all the diaspora and everybody who came back and everybody who's in Jerusalem, they are despised. Wow, that's kind of interesting. Constant theme of the Bible, right? Despised and rejected because of who they are. Interesting. But what's astounding is that Jesus says to this woman, and this is King James. We haven't gotten to the Greek yet. I just got to the Greek. But here's the King James. I got the NIV above. I guess I could show it to you just to remind you since it's a little more modern English. Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And then in the King James, it says, Jesus answered and said to her, if thou knowest the gift of God and who it is that said to thee, give me the drink, thou wouldst have asked of him and he would have given thee living water. Okay. Is this the normal question you ask of a stupid person who's a drunk worker? This is probably the most erudite question that is asked of any human being in the gospel. Even Nicodemus didn't get this treatment. Nicodemus did not get a, a question of this spiritual import, this import. We're going to talk about conclusions about that in a second. But I want we, we need to see what the answer is. But let's look at it in the Greek and see what it actually says in the Greek. It's not too far off. Here's the Greek uh, transliter transliterated or in the direct. Here's the literal. Uh, Apocrente, he concluded for himself. As we know, this means that he thought about it. This is the indication in Greek that he thought about it. Jesus, and he said to her, if you had seen with physical eyes, and I think it's really interesting, physical eyes, the Dorian, the sacrificial gift of God and who it is, the making a logical argument to you, you give to me to imbibe you wish a supposition, you would have asked him, and he would have given you a supposition to you, hydro, to water living. Now, I want to point out a couple of things in Greek. Number one, the word is not, there are other words in Greek that can mean a gift, just a gift. So if I give you a gift, right? But this word, doron, is dorian, but doron is the basis of this word means a sacrificial gift. It means a gift that is given in sacrifice. In Greek, it is a it's, it is not your normal word. You don't use this word for, okay, I'm giving you a present or a, a, you know, a gift or this or that or the other thing. This is not your, your Christmas gift. This is not your birthday gift. This is a gift. The only time you give a Doron is when you when you take it to the altar, to a sacrificial altar, to Zeus or to whatever god, and you present it. So this word, you know, we translate, what do we translate it as? What did our translators translate it as? Um, the gift of God. Cool. We don't have a word in English for a sacrificial gift, but Greek does, and that's really cool, I think. Anyway, um, also point out to you, it's funny how this works. The other thing I want to point out to you is in, in Greek, okay, in English we used to have subjunctive to, subjunctive to. We don't have subjunctive, uh, the second subjunctive uh, in English anymore. The Greeks don't either. They don't have a verb form. We used to have a verb form. If I were king, what does that mean? The subjunctive to, that means I could never ever be king, but I make a supposition if I were king. 
right? So by saying were, instead of if I was king, was king indicates in English that I could potentially possibly be king. Where were king means I could never be king, and I realized that. It's called a supposition. In Greek, we have a supposition that's on, which indicates a, a wish, a supposition. It does not mean something you can never be. It means that it's a supposition. Instead of a verb form, they have a specific word that is added. It's very similar to uh, Japanese. Japanese has, has word forms, small words, that are added to indicate the nominative, the different uh, possessive, for example, in their language, where in Greek, on means a supposition. So Jesus uses his supposition twice. He uses it in terms of, um, let's see, he indicates a supposition you would have asked, and he has also a supposition for living water, living hydro water, which is really an interesting term. So, uh, Let's see what it says literally. This is what it says in a translate, literal translation. Jesus concluded for himself, and he said to her, If you had seen with physical eyes the sacrificial gift of God, and who is making a logical argument to you, you give to me to imbibe, you should have asked him, and she should have given you living water. Now, this is also a Greek, a Greek, um, not satire, uh, irony. Irony, a Greek irony, because he says to her, if you had seen with physical eyes the sacrificial gift of God, what is she looking at? The She's looking at the sacrificial gift of God. So Jesus is giving her a sub... Okay, this is, actually, this is completely adverse to his culture. This is not a rabbinic question. What would a rabbi ask? Where are you looking at? <laughs> kind of, a rabbi would probably say nothing and probably say, you know, <laughs> what are you going to make of this, right? You know, it, it, really, a rab, rabbinical, the rabbi, the rabbinical method does not ask questions. It makes pronouncements where what is, what is the Greek method? The, yeah, the Socratic method. Well, I just did it, right? Uh, okay, sorry, I probably overwhelmed you with too many questions, but I, I was taught to use the Socratic method because that's what we as Greek thinkers and, and understanders, brainers, whatever, we think in terms of the Greek method and methodology. And so Greek, Greek is living to us. It's alive to us. And the idea is, of course, you ask your students questions, Right? And your students give you back answers. And if they're great answers, you go, yay. If they're me, you know, okay answers, you go, yeah. And if they're bad answers, you try and fix it, right? Well, actually, Socrates would have said you ask more questions. But look what Jesus did. He asked your questions. If you had seen, this is like said an irony, Greek irony. If you see what physical eyes, sacrificial gift of God, which is, yes, she's looking at him and is making a logical argument to you to give you to me to imbibe. You give to me to abide. What did he just say? He just told her he's the sacrificial gift of God. <laughs> okay, again, it's beautiful. You should have asked him, him, me, and he should have given you living water. Okay, this is a really amazing question. You don't ask this question. Would you ask this question if somebody's no bright? I, let, let me, let me, we're going to get to what she says, which I think is very important, but, okay, what is our view, what is our view of women in this period? They're repressed. Totally repressed, patriotic society, right, uh, they have no rights, they have no, you know, no one cares about them, no one thinks about them, no one cares about their opinions. Uh, what did John just tell you? I mean, I mean okay, look, I know, uh, we're Greek kind of culture, we've got this Roman thing going, so what do we want somebody to do? <laughs> tell you the answer, right? We want the conclusion. We want, we want John to say, you know, this was a really smart woman among many smart women. 
And women were not like considered to be too dumb because obviously here's a woman who's part of the workers in Sikar who is considered stupid by Sirach and by the Jerusalem Pharisees, Sadducees. But Jesus is actually asking her an erudite question. Well, it's more than asking her. They're actually, I mean, all this language, they're having a logical argument, aren't mm -hmm. they? I mean, they're, they're, we get the short version, but this probably was a long conversation. Exactly, precisely. This, you know, we wish, because we're English, you know, English, Roman, whatever, speakers, we want the whole story, right? We want all the dialogue. We want everything. But <laughs> yeah, there's nothing wrong with that except for printing costs. Today, yeah, yeah. a piece of paper costs less than a penny, you know, and you can print it with a laser printer. But in, in, we have electronic, we have ether, ether writing, right? We, we can go away, or ether photos, because they don't exist. They're just on digital media. But yet, in that day, the cost of a book, 40,000 bucks. So what do you have to do? Give the short version. Give the most important part. Reader's digest or whatever. Now, I want to throw this out, too. If John had written this and what your perception of the world about women was in that era, would John be a bestseller? <laughs> but yet he was. I mean, John, okay, uh, <laughs> we know there are probably thousands of books, not millions, but thousands of books written in this period. We have some documents, you know, Gnostic documents, other documents. The Gnostic documents weren't, you know, they're not really Christian-based, but they weren't reproduced. We found them in Nagamati. Uh, we found some other stuff, a few things in Dead Sea, but mostly you never find the um, Gnostic documents with normal Christian documents that we, you know, that are considered regular. Well, why not? Why don't we have a whole bunch of Gnostic documents that are kind of hanging around? They weren't popular they were enough to be reproduced. They yeah. weren't popular enough to be reproduced. But yet we got John, and John was so popular that not only was it reproduced in the early period in massive amounts, Old Constantine said, I want, how many, how do you have, 50? 50 hand-done, um, uh, what, what's the book form? Uh, codexes. He wanted 50 codexes made of the New Testament. We have copies of, the, of that codex. They included John and all the books of the New Testament. And then constantly through every period, they have reproduced and handwritten, mostly handwritten until, of course, Mark, uh, until, uh, uh, the printing press, Gutenberg. Yeah, until Gutenberg. So anyway, so I'm just saying, if this were that, um, if this were that far away from the norm, somebody would have fixed it, right? Well, that's what Brown says, right? Brown says that the church made this stuff up. Would, if you're a patriarch, would you make this up? If you're anti-woman, would you make this up? Look what she says. Here's the NIV. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? I mean, okay, you know immediately this woman is what kind of thinker? Literal. What's that? Literal. Literal, Literal. which means she is what kind of thinker? Greek. Greek. Greek is concrete. Greek is literal. She is giving a literal answer to this Jesus guy. She knows exactly what he said. She gets it. But she's like, okay, how are you going to get this living water? Okay, this is a shalom. Okay, um, the woman said to him, sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep, and whence then hast thou that living water? Total Greek question. Makes a logical argument. She makes a logical argument to him. So, so, so try to read between the words. <laughs> yeah, dude, you ain't got nothing to pick it out of water out. What are you going to do? Huh? 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 Right? Logical argument. Deb. And the married woman, she said, supreme in authority. So it's interesting. She calls him supreme in authority. Uh, not to. A bailing vessel you have, you hold. And the hole in the ground, it's profound. It's deep. From which place, state, source, or cause, accordingly, you hold the water, the living water. 
very Greek. Um, uh, would you put, okay, not even the Greeks did this, okay? I mean, I, I, I love the Greeks, I love the Greek stuff, but the Greeks don't even talk about Xanthippe. Xanthippe, who is the wife of Socrates, who is supposed to be really a shrewish kind of woman, but yet I want to hear her shrewishness. When we say shrewish, what do we mean? Greek irony and satire. I mean, her words were probably amazing, biting but amazing. So I really would love to see it, but they're not recorded. You know, we get Sappho, but not Xanthippe, which is kind of sad. But anyway, the married woman makes a large growing attempt, supreme in authority. You hold not also a bailing vessel, and the hole in the ground is profound. Accordingly, from what place do you hold the living water? Very, very reasonable question. Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? What does this show? I mean, even before we get to the Greek, what did she just show? She knows her old heritage. Testament. What's that? She knows her Old Testament. Yeah. Not only does she know her Old Testament, but she knows, she, does she understand the question he asked? What do you think? Well, yeah, but she's asking about Jacob. She's comparing him. She's really, isn't she still thinking of the water, of the water as living water for her? Well, she's made this. Well, okay. If somebody told you, if you, if somebody just came up to you and said, "Hey, I got some living one, living one." Now, you go, "What is living water?" Right? I got fish in it. Bugs. <laughs> <laughs> and she's made the jump from. Being able to draw the water without a cup, so all of a sudden, are you greater than my father Jacob? How she made that jump? Bingo! Exactly. Let me tell you what living water means. Okay, there there is um, basically a Hebrew understanding and there is a Greek understanding. I put some notes here, but I don't have the notes there. Um, remember when they brought the water from the pool of Shiloh and they poured it on the temple, on, on the on the altar. That water was at one time considered living water. Do you remember the Pool of Shiloh? The Pool of Shiloh. The big deal about the Pool of Shiloh, the Pool of Shiloh, the Pool of, the, the pool of Peace, is that today, I think even today, it is as still as, still as still. But apparently, when it was first dug and made, it was considered a well of living water. The water constantly refreshed itself. And what they discovered when they were digging in there is that the hole over time where they had dug it from Mount whatever, uh, Mount of Olives area, had been uh, filled in. So they opened it. I don't know if that's improved the flow or they intentionally left it the way it was. But we know in the time of Jesus that people, and Mary, we're going to see this. It's in chapter 5. So people, people who were lame or people who had issues would wait around the pool, right, for what happened? The water to become living. And when the water was living, then they believed that an angel was touching the water and they could get in and heal, right? And that will come in chapter 5. So this is a, this is a precursor to death. And this is, you know, this is the way John is, right? It's a logos to tell us. It's not, it's not stories. It's not tales. It, it, they are connected. They are connected narratives by a logical argument to unstated telos, just like all great Greek. So, what is really profound about this is the living water that the Hebrews believed in was touched by God, who would then would heal you or help you or whatever, right? Uh, slake your thirst. Now, the Greeks also believed in living water. And living water in the sense of the Greeks was water that was moving. So like a stream of water. So water that's moving in a stream. Um, okay. Are you greater than our father Jacob, etc., etc.? Let's see what it says in the Greek. Here's the... I got the Greek there, but I won't bore you with that. I'll give you the literal. But art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank there of himself and his children and his cattle? Okay. What do we know about this well? Is this living water? No, it's not moving water. Remember, even today, 
Jacob's well. I showed you a picture of it. It's in a, an Orthodox cathedral. The water is still, and they still use it. It's, it's a good well, apparently, still, but it's not bubbling water. That's She's giving him a Greek irony, right? Because the water is not living either, in either a Hebrew sense or a Greek sense. It's not moving water. So, art thou greater than our father Jacob? Let's see what it says in Greek. Not a lace, you great or large, are of the patros of the father of us Jacob. So Jacob's her father, which is, means she's, uh, she's Hebrew. Who, which, what gave, Edokin, him and to us, uh, the hole in the ground, the fear, Kai, and himself from out of or among of it imbibed, and the offspring of him, and the stock of him. You are not as great as our father. <laughs> ah, it's really cute how our translators, okay, why did our translators change it from art thou greater than to what the Greek really says, you are not as great as our father, Jacob. She ain't dumb. Who is this guy? This is just some guy. And by the way, she knows he's from the Galil. How does she know she's from the Galil? He probably has a, a, the accent of the Galil. The Orthodox. <laughs> more, like, more like the accent of the guy that's from the, that country, right? Because they knew they were Galil. But he's speaking Greek, and she's speaking Greek, by the way. We know that. Um, you are not as great as our father Jacob, who gave us his hole in the ground, and himself from out of it imbibed, and his offspring his life son. The reason they keep calling a hole in the ground, as opposed to any other word, remember, they first said it was called the font. It, they said it was a font. What does a font give you the impression of? Someone's filling it. Right. Yeah, spring, a filling, right? But it's not still water. So the reason they keep calling a hole in the ground, which I think is beautiful in the Greek, is to tell you that this is a hole in the ground. It is a well. It is well, we would, okay, a Kansas well. But it doesn't even have one of those uh, uh, powered windmills, windmills that's pulling the water out, right? And so you're getting your water in your kitchen. You, can, you you got to do this, maybe, or, or put down a thing. Yes, sir? Can you show us where it goes from are you not to you are in the Greek? Yeah. 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 Um, matter of fact, it uses identity, I, not you, large or great, are, of the patros, of the father. Greek doesn't indicate questions the way English does, by changing word order, necessarily. And Greek, uh, you, if you're going to find a question in Greek, usually it's going to be an indicator of supposition or some other way. But remember, other languages... Um, Greek, we, we in English do a couple of things to the indicate questions, like German does too. In German and in English, we change the word order to indicate that it's a question. And then we have this lovely thing called a question mark. Right? There is no punctuation. So I can't indicate to you. So all I can do is show you, for example, here's the original Greek. Not you, greater than, are the father of us, Jacob. And remember in Greek, Greek does different word orders. This literally says, you, you are not greater than the father of us, Jacob, the Jacob's father. So, like I said, they wanted to take the sting away, right? Because this lady, look, this is not some dumb broad that just went to the well. I mean, that's our impression. We want to think that, right? Well, what but, have we been taught that? That she's scared of her community. She's going out in the heat of the day. She's lived a horrible lifestyle or whatever. And therefore, she must be shy and recluse and whatever. And doesn't have a spine because she's whatever. And this is 
showing a different different side of her than I've ever seen. Yeah, I'll agree with you. She was bullied. She intentionally went at a, at noon because she didn't want to be bullied. Like, what is okay? What do we consider people that usually solve their problems by correcting their life and what they're doing, or at least what they're doing, right? Now, she may not have corrected her whole life, right? She's going to be caught up in what she is. But I think the point here is, okay, maybe you ladies don't like it. Maybe you guys don't like it either. But I think to a large degree, this represents every intelligent, knowing person that Jesus is approaching especially a Greek or a Samaritan person, which we are, we're Gentile-ish, right? The Samaritan's kind of Gentile-ish. And so, steeped in sin, not stupid, thinking, right? That's all of us. Steeped in sin, we're thinking, and Jesus comes up and asks us this question. And, he, and, he, and if we're wise, he confronts us with our lifestyle. He confronts us with our life and says, this ain't right. What are you going to do about it, right? So let's see. This is, I think this is just beautiful stuff. <clears throat> Jesus answered this NIV, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. Okay, now we're getting deep into this. Jesus answered and said, whoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. He concluded for himself, Jesus, and he said to her, all the whole, the abiding from out from among of the hydos of this will thirst anew, a palen. Jesus concluded himself and said to her, all imbibing from out of this water will thirst for it anew. Okay. Now that is very good Greek, very concrete. Obvi you know, we'd say obvious. Uh, when somebody just brought up living water, it ain't as obvious as it sounds, right? And let's see what she says. It's beautiful. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. He did not even give this to Nicodemus. Old Nicodemus got the, the spirit, the Panuma stuff, but he is giving her something entirely different. We'll talk about that specifically. But whoever is a drinker of this water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up to everlasting life. Let's say the Greek. Uh, who but on a supposition? Who but on a supposition? He may imbibe from among of the hydros of the water. Who I, ego, ego, declarative pronoun. Whoa. This is a big deal. When he said ego, ego doso of him, no or not, he will thirst for, enter into the age, into the age, contrawise, to the water who I give to him, that I give to him, it will cause or become in him a font of water springing up to life perpetual. Okay. There is, this is huge. Let's see what it says in the translation. This is a little translation. But whoever may imbibe from out of the water, which I, I, ego, will give to him, he will not ever thirst for it, for it into the age. For it into the age. Literally into the messianic era, age. Contrawise, the water which I will give to him will cause to become into him a font of water, spring up into a life perpetual. Okay, remember I told you, it's not a hole in the ground. It's a font springing up inside. It is living water. And now Jesus gives us this new thing, life perpetual, life perpetual. He, had, he talked about this in chapter 3 to Nicodemus. He talked about this. John talked about this in chapter 3 at the end, right, in connecting Nicodemus to, from the Spirit, to the baptism, right? Baptism being the mikvah. And now we have water, okay? The mikvah water is on the... Outside. This water is... Do you see where this logical argument has gone with John? John set us up. The Spirit, you are, you are born of 
water and you're born, and he didn't mean water, he meant you were physically born and you were born of the spirit, pneuma. And then John tells us there's a disagreement about cleansing, about purification, the mikvah. And the conclusion of that, well, we didn't get a, you know, a telos, he didn't give us, a, well, he kind of gave us a telos, but the telos end was that Jesus Christ, the baptism of Christ, right? The external baptism that was not done by Christ, but by the disciples, obviously provided some degree of purification. But now we get, we've moved from the external to the internal. Now, it's very interesting. Uh, this, this, um, there's a lot in this that you can kind of start thinking about. Like, for example, do the Samaritans do a mikvah? Jewish. Yeah, and they're eating, they're eating sacrificial stuff, but not from the temple, right? And so they're following the temple stuff, so we presume that they probably are, right? That's all we can presume, because we don't have any written documentation. We just gotta go with what we already we know, right? So presumably, yes, they went through the mikvah process to be able to eat teruma. Because their truma, though, was done on whatever the two different places that they sacrificed in the uh, uh, Bilal and uh, uh, Mount Gerizim. Yeah, on the mount, right? So we, you know, we presume that they did, right, follow certain practice. The practice they didn't follow, though, was the complete Jewish practice. So, you know, I put this, here's some notes I have. Um, not thirst into the age. I had the point, the messianic age, because who declared this is the messianic age? Who made that declaration? John did, and so did Jesus. They both said that it is now the coming of the time when what? Heaven and earth shall come together. That is the Messianic age. And by the way, the Messianic age is when after the, well, we know the answer to the end point. But in the Messianic age, the only, only sacrifice that will be required is the Thanksgiving sacrifice. I love it when we properly sing or do the, the whole thing because guess what it says? We do the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, right? Wow, beautiful. Um, but anyway, this idea is in the context of Jesus as a Christ. Jesus already just told her that I am basically, but we're going to get even more to that. It's important to note the Jewish people were looking for Messiah. Who else are looking for a Messiah? The Jewish people are looking for a Messiah? And, and by the way, the Samaritans really want a Messiah. Everybody thinks they're workers, drunk, and stupid. So boy, I could really use a Messiah, right? Need some help here. Um, animism and pantheonic paganism are not particularly concerned with, with salvation, but Mysterion is. Um, why I want to point this out is there is a really strong chance Matter of fact, there's a really strong chance that every Jewish person that you see in the New Testament is probably steeped to a degree in Mysterion. So much so that Jesus uses the ideas of Mysterion all the time. Paul does it too. It's used ubiquitously in the New Testament. Um, and this idea, for example, living water is not necessarily Mysterion, but you know, right? Every Mysterion, almost every, every Mysterion, has a baptism. Every Mysterion has a baptism, which is very interesting. Sometimes it's not water, but every Mysterion has a baptism. Um, just to point out, the Sadducees and Orthodox Jews believe there is no afterlife and no eternal soul. Adam and Nefesh is all there is. That's it. Hellenization is for led to two questions. The Greeks assumed an eternal soul. That's what we, we saw in chapter 3. Therefore, what happens to the eternal soul? Second, the diaspora brought up the question, what happens if you can't accomplish the required mitzvah? What happened to everybody who went to Babylon? They were breaking, remember, how many, I always, I always say, I, I haven't written down, 32, I think it's the 32 big ones. Not just including the Ten Commandments, 
but there are 32 big ones that the JPS handbook, the, the Jewish JPS, whatever, JPS handbook. I got a copy of it. You should have a copy. Well, you don't need it. It's not this thick. But the JPS handbook tells you what modern Jews believe in terms of Judaism. It's really a cool book, but it goes back to the history of Judaism. And the thing about the history of Judaism is that, you know, they are the, the mitzvah, they list the 32 big items. There's 32 of them. Going to the temple at the, for a man, a woman didn't have to, but a man had to go to the uh, pilgrim festival three times a year. A woman could light the blessing candles. A man may not. A huge fight right now in <laughs> obviously not Orthodox Judaism about whether homosexuals can light the candles. Whoa, what an interesting concept that might be, right? Because men, remember, they believe, the Jewish people believe, and by the way, Christians did at a time too in King Horos, that woman did not sin. She was punished afterwards in the aftermath of the you know creation or whatever with Adam, but the reason she doesn't have to do certain, Eve supposedly and women do not have to do certain mitzvot because they are blessed more than men. And by the way, ladies, you were perfect with two X chromosomes. Men have a broken chromosome and they were produced first. So therefore, therefore they are lesser than you are. And Orthodox Judaism, if that is a big point in Orthodox Judaism, even though one well, of the mitzvot in Orthodox Judaism is to say every day, thank God I was not born a woman, you know, whatever. I don't get that, whatever. <coughs> There's something wrong with these guys thinking. They're not Greek thinkers, which is sad. Um, but the Greeks asked this question. The Greeks assume this, but the diaspora about this question because all of the Jews in the current diaspora have this same problem. Remember when we studied in Acts, Paul went out to them and said, what's the first thing he said to them? I know that you cannot complete the law, and therefore I bring you the, the culmination of the law, Jesus Christ. Anyway, that was a great thing. So anyway, we have a Mysterion Greek view of the eternal soul that led to the question of salvation for the Greeks, the Romans, the Egyptians, and ultimately for Tina Hodos. So the diaspora led to the Greek, the Jewish sects, to the question of sufficiency of the, mes of the Mosaic Covenant, why is this important? The Samaritans are a people that believe in the Mosaic Covenant and believe they're covered by the Mosaic Covenant, but they don't follow the Mosaic Covenant. We are very interesting people, as Dean Hodos. We theologically do not believe we are part of the, mess of the Mosaic Covenant, but we sure want to act like we are, right? But we're Gentiles. We're under the Noahic Covenant and not the Samaritans. Would, if, the, if you told a Samaritan they're under the Noahic Covenant, what would they say? Wow. Yeah, we're, the, we're under Moses. Moses is our, is, is our beginning of our faith. We are, Mo, we are Mosaic Covenant. What would the Jews say about Samaritans? <laughs> not the hand, right? So this is really important because this colors this woman's view. I don't think it covers colors Jesus' view at all. Jesus has got the total understanding, but it, it covers her view. So this, this diaspora led the Jewish sects to the question of sufficient of the Mosaic Covenant. The Old Testament context displays both the eternal soul and the insufficiency of the Mosaic Covenant. The rise of Pharisees in response to diaspora at the Maccabean period reflect the idea of eternal soul and the reach for sufficiency through knowledge. They basically, the Pharisees kind of started this Gnostic thing that Christianity uh, recreated or, or set in place. The solution was Christ, was a Messiah. The Sadducees saw this as nationalistic. A king. This is very important. Every Sadducee, every priest, even to a degree, I think John the Baptist, although John the Baptist may have been more enlightened, but every Sadducee saw this as a nationalistic, because why? When you're dead in a Sadducee view, you're dead. They're nothing else. The Pharisees saw this as nationalistic and for salvation, to rescue them from the insufficiency of the Mosaic system. 
They knew it. Right? If you read, um, I brought copies before. I don't think I have one with me. But you know the um, of the Talmud, uh, of the yeah, the Talmud. I've got I've got the Talmud. I don't know if I have all of it. The Steins Steinsaltz translation of the Talmud. Um, at the very beginning, it even says, and we know it right from the Old Testament. I didn't re-put the quotes up there, but we know that it was insufficient because they even declare it to be insufficient. Sacrifice is only sufficient for what kind of sin? Unintentional sin. It says that in the Old Testament straight out, and it says that in the Talmud. So they knew there was a problem in the Mosaic system because almost <laughs> you can fool yourself all you want. But all sin is potential. Even when I was a little kid, I remember when I did things that were wrong, I know I was doing wrong, and I knew I was going to get it, and I knew that if, you know, I did nothing as a child. You, you know, they talk about people doing things, uh, you know, going out of control, right, and just going. That never, ever happened to me. If I hit my brother, I knew I hit my brother. And I was hitting my brother for a reason. It was a good reason to me, but he didn't think so. So anyway, and my mom would get me too. So I'm just saying, I knew it. And I think every sin is intentional. There's no unintentional sin. But that's okay. The Pharisees knew this was a problem. Um, the proof text for this, it's officially comes from the Gemara and the Mishnah. And in the, in the Gemara, the sages, describe the following. And I think I've given you this before, but I want to repeat it. Because this is really good stuff. Um, our, our Samaritan woman may not be completely familiar with this, but I bet you she was. Uh, she was probably really familiar with this. Not because she read the Gemara Sages, but because this happened in her era. Okay, She knew this. Roughly 40 years prior to the destruction of the temple, which was destroyed in the year 70 AD, the red rope, the scarlet, look, 40 years prior to the destruction of the temple, 70 minus 40 is? 30. Which is? Jesus yeah, Jesus was crucified 33 AD. It's really well documented and known. Um, the red tape, the scarlet thread, stopped turning white. This caused the nation's leaders great concern. As of the year 30 AD, God stopped getting his approval on Yom Kippur. The scarlet thread no longer turned white. God was no longer willing to accept Yom Kippur's sacrifice. As of the year 30 AD, God stopped dwelling in the temple, which 40 years later was destroyed. That's Gemara Sages. That is not a Christian document. That is from a Talmudic document. According to the Mishnah, the earliest rabbinic interpretation of the Bible commandment, the high priest divided a thread of crimson wool, tied one half to the temple door and the other half to the horn of the scapegoat itself. They say the scarlet thread on the temple door would turn white, which would indicate that their sins were forgiven. But they knew their sins weren't forgiven. This was the sins for the nation, right? The Talmud records the uh, four Amish events that took place 40 years before the temple's construction, 30 AD, hmm. which would be the time Messiah died. The lot for Yahweh's goat would always come up in the left hand. The thought was, they thought it was a good sign if it came up in the right hand, two. The scarlet thread of the temple door stopped turning white, three. The westernmost light of the uh, temple menorah would not stay lit, but for the temple doors would open by themselves. We read in the Jerusalem Talmud, 40 years before the destruction of the temple, the western light went out, the crimson thread remained crimson, the lot for the Lord always came up in the left hand, they would close the gates of the temple by night and get up in the morning and find them wide open. This is Nasur, uh, these pages, this is one of the Talmudic documents. And a similar passage involved Babylonian Talmud. Okay, I have two Talmuds. I have the Jerusalem Talmud, I have the Babylonian Talmud. Uh, the Babylonian Talmud, these are guys in Dyspora in Babylon, which we don't hear much about, uh, especially New Testament. We don't talk much about them, but they're there. They're all there. Remember, the three schools or four schools of the rabbis, the Galil, Jerusalem school, the Babylonian school, and the Alexandrian school. Very important. Uh, when we did Hebrews, we learned all about the Alexandrian school. Um, our rabbis taught during the last 40 years before the destruction of the temple, the lot for the Lord did not come up in the right hand, nor did the crimson colored strap become white, nor did the westernmost light shine, and the doors of the temple would open by themselves. That's Sankel version, Yoma. 
Both Talmuds recount the same information. This indicates the knowledge of events was accepted by the widespread Jewish community. Yes, when Jesus is talking to this woman about 30 AD, 40 years before the destruction, this is happening right now in her time. This is like, well, if they had newspapers, it would be the top of the newspaper. Everybody's talking about this. Do you think everybody's been talking about this? This is a big deal. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Okay, that's interesting. Pretty straightforward, very Greek. The woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water that I may thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Let's see what the Greek says. She makes a logical argument. That means she was yakking. She was talking. She was communicating. Threw her towards him. The married woman, supreme in authority, you give to me this water in order that, not least, I might thirst, but not even I pass through within to bail up. The married woman makes a logical argument to him, supreme in authority, you give to me this water in order that I might not thirst for water, and I need not pass through within the town to bail up. This is really an interesting statement from her. If he gives her the water, what is going to be the, the result for her? She'll no longer mm -hmm. suffer the belittling slings and arrows mm -hmm. of the townspeople. Yeah, the, the physical slings and arrows that she's facing in her life. She won't have to go at noon, right? Now, she's not thinking much about her husband. But that's an interesting statement. The married woman makes this logical argument, so I don't need to pass through within the town to bail up. And she might not thirst. That's really cool. Very Greek. Very Greek. And like I said, this goes back to the woman herself and her needs. She's obviously not, she's obviously not a Parthenon. In other words, she's not a, she's not a virgin. She is alone wearing a married woman's shawl covering her hair. Her greatest desire isn't necessarily to not to have to get water, but not have to go through the town, even go to the well. She's seeking not to be abused by her neighbors because of her past and current life. And therefore, Jesus, okay, now this is very Greek. Because in Greek, logos to tell us, what do we, now let me put this back. This is very rabbinic. In a rabbi, we don't do what? We don't ask questions, we don't make direct comments. There's no direct comments in, in Hebrew. In Greek, you ask questions, but you don't usually make direct comments, right? This is very beautiful, what he says. So told her, go call your husband and come back. Yes, let's see, Jesus said unto her, go call my husband and come hither. He makes a logical argument. In other words, this isn't just, hey, go get your husband. He is talking to her. Maybe even asking her, you know, some questions. He makes a logic to her, you lead under, you emit a sound, the under, the man of you, and you come or go within. He makes a logic argument to her, you lead under, go away, and emit a sound, call your man, and you come within this place. You come within this place. And she says, I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. Hmm. This is really an interesting, there's a lot in this that we're going to have to ask questions about, see if we can figure out, but very deep. The one answer said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, thou hast well said, I have no husband. She concluded for herself, the married woman, and she said to him, no or not, I hold the man. I don't hold a man. He makes a logical argument to her, Jesus. Well, you have said that a man you do not hold. The married woman concluded for herself, and she said to him, I hold not a man. Jesus makes a logical argument to her. Well, have you said that a man I hold not? Now, 
let's let's see where this goes. But why, why do they why do they put down that she's a married woman if she's not married? She's not a virgin. She's not a patron. She's a guy named. She's wearing. I, I got this before. You maybe you were in the class, but um, women covered their hair when they were married. We we had some documentation about that um, from rabbinic sources that we we believe or they believe that women in that era covered their hair. Virgins did not. Women who were unmarried, you know, let their hair be long, and that was an indicator that one was was married and one was not. Uh, this is true too. If yes. you were a widow or divorced, could you keep covering your hair then? Yes, because in in both Greek and in Hebrew society, it was very important in their cultures to recognize a woman who was a virgin and a woman who was not. Right? We did too, uh, you know, and we did in in our Western culture, uh, Mademoiselle versus Madame, and you know, um, Machin versus. Uh, Frau and um, Miss versus Mrs. Today we just kind of blend it all together because Ms. with Ms. Ms. Yeah, Ms. Like, okay. It just gives authors another fun way to uh, kind of help confuse people. But anyway, um, you know, in the past we thought it was important to recognize <laughs> women who were unmarried and, uh, you know, men too. In England we would call them masters, you know, master. As opposed to Mister, Mister meant that you were a married man, or that you were, you know, uh, either professional or whatever, not taken in terms of, uh, you know, marriage usually. But you know, we we've gone way away from that, which is really interesting. Um, the fact is, you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Hmm. For thou hast had five husbands, and, the, and he whom thou hast has is not thy husband, and that, and that saith thou truly. Fifth day, assigning a reason, men, you have held, and at present now, who you hold is not a man, not false, you have uttered. So assigning a reason, you have held five men, and now whom you hold is not your man. You've uttered a not false tale. Boy, this gets really, really difficult. And, you know, uh, I think everybody here has puzzled about it for their whole lives, if you've heard this account, right? Because you want to know, how is it that she can be... now? In our worldview, which is really not correct, you got to have what to be married? The government's become totally involved in the marriage process, which it never was for thousands and thousands and ten, at least 10, 12,000 years. But the government wants a piece of that action so that they can, uh, what, I guess, charge you uh, and ensure, what, ensure uh, yeah, of course, you great breeding? Get a you discount. Get a discount on your marriage. There's a lot of, I mean, we have a whole body of law and legal system that in a way sort of requires it, though, because with our like, spouses don't have to testify against their spouse, or like in cases of divorce and you know, like how do you split things up and just like things of inheritance and all sorts of things. So the legal status of the custody is important now that we need to probably have that. Oh, I think they have the same legal. Authorities it did today, but the difference was what? What? What was the big difference? Ministers. Church ministers. The ministers, yeah, the church administered it, and as long as you were a minister and they didn't have a license, right? Matter of fact, let's go back to rabbinic period. If you read my book Centurion. What did Ruth want more than anything? The marriage certificate, the shot. She wanted to be, you know, she never told the centurion, but he knew that she wanted that. That is the greatest covet, the most covetous thing that a woman in that era, a, Jew, a Jewish woman would want. Is she want an official certificate that said that she was married to him. Because that gave her certain rights, certain authorities, certain power. 
power over their children, all kinds of important things, right? In today's era, we're the same place, right? Yeah, we, we were saying that came from the, the religious system. That yes. Shifted, so. yeah. You look back but, in history, and they're, they always go back to their the church Bibles, and it's all recorded in the Bible. Who, yeah. Whose children were whose, who was married. Yep. The contrary argument to that is Kansas does not require a marriage license to legally marry. And it, that's really messy. It is. It doesn't even have a year requirement. With respect to inheritance, with respect to medical, you can just just, all of it. If you just present very, very yourself very as messy. married, they see you as married. So if you go around calling someone your husband and he's not, then you guys split up, then they could just use the force. And I agree. The the common law. It's not common law. It's not common law. Seven years, like under states are. You just have to represent yourself as married, and you're considered married. Wow. Well, okay. Let I used to have to counsel that a lot. Let's talk about this just a little bit because I think it's important for us to note this. How do we get to where we are today? The European guys had it clear. You went to a priest. You, 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 there was no secular ceremonies in the in Europe. Never. You went to a priest or a pastor or somebody, and you said, "Marry us," and he would say, "Okay, we need witnesses. We need at least two witnesses." You married you. You wrote it in your Bible. He gave you a certificate because many people couldn't afford Bibles, so he would do something. Or the witnesses were the witnesses to your marriage, right? And so even if you couldn't write it down or sign anything, then that was the witness to marriage. And it was the church. And many times the church, especially when they had paper and pencil, or paper and pens, they could write it down. So and so was married here in this church, even if you couldn't record it or have a record. When they came to America, what was the problem? Well, you met some girl out in Dodge City, and there ain't no pastor, there ain't no priest, and all you're going through is on a wagon train, and you say, hi. Let's go. We're going to the promised land, right? And she said, okay. And then, giddy up. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Or you jump over the broom, or you do something. You know? How do you do this? And many times people would go back, and they'd find a pastor, a priest, or whatever, and they'd eventually get it. But what happens when you don't have churches, you don't have the setup? The, in America, we had a problem, and so we get common law, which you know totally makes sense in in what was happening in that era. And then we get the government getting involved. The government has to, you know, uh, sanctify marriage, which is, wow, wow, wait a second. What do they have to do with marriage? I mean, yes, there are legal things involved, but why not leave it to the church? Oh, we can't leave the church. The church, you can't trust the church, right? Those slimy pastors and slimy Christian people, <laughs> come on. You can't trust them, or even the Jewish people. We can't trust them to... To take care of that stuff, which they did for like what twenty thousand years, or you know, at least two thousand plus years. Anyway, yeah, certainly the church we have a lot of power as well. A lot of yeah, yeah. and, and uh, God's going to be upset with that. But anyway, we'll get to more of this. This is really deep stuff. We'll try to answer this question next week. Thank you, Father, for your word. I pray you look after us this week. In your name, we pray. Amen. In the United States, we had a lot of people who were of other religions or not religious. 